package and I actually would take those and make furniture out of them. So I was quite industrious. And I think photography just came very naturally to me. Um, so yeah, I started taking pictures of family. I had cats in those days, so they became, uh, you know, subject matter. Um, we had a pool in our backyard since it was Los Angeles. So I took pictures of my friends jumping into the swimming pool. So whatever sort of, and, and the garden, trees. Um, so whatever kind of caught my eye, uh, I don't know. I was just, um, I just, I don't know. I just responded. I don't know that I was actually thinking about anything. Did you then go on to study photography? Well, again, I mean, you moved from those that childhood interest to obviously something much more professional and serious as you are now. What happened in between times to develop the, the both the technical and, and perhaps that artistic side as well? So in high school, we had a pretty sophisticated high school where I grew up and um, they actually had a photography class and they had a full on dark room. So at the age of 17, I took a photo class and my parents generously bought me my first 35 millimeter camera, which was a Canon FTB. No, yes, I think that's what it was. It was like a brick. And um, I discovered Tri-X film very early. And so I, I learned darkroom. And I think that was really the turning point for me. And I remember we also had to do a photo assignment with color slide film and then do like a like a presentation with music and so it mine came out rather well so somehow I had a an aptitude for it um, and then in college I um, I went to UCLA and I became a staff photographer on the Daily Brew in my college paper but I actually never really studied photography formally um, which I shouldn't say that um, I was autodidactic but I just I learned you know as I went and I learned from other photographers and then after I graduated from UCLA, I also started taking photo workshops, mainly through the Friends of Photography in Carmel. So I actually took um, one of the last workshops in Yosemite with Ansel Adams. I was thinking I might do sort of traditional black and white large format um, and then discovered I couldn't stand working on a tripod that I and, and I just I had to be moving. And I think I was still the physicality of being a photojournalist and sort of an activist really was pulling me so yeah so i just kept going <laughs> I'd, I'd like to come back to some of those labels i mean you've just mentioned the word photojournalist and you're variously described as a photojournalist a documentary photographer a fine art photography photographer and when i see your work i often see elements of all of those labels within them and i, I just wondered how you described yourself and actually do, do these labels even matter to you Oh, well, you know, actually, I just consider myself to be a photographer. And so, but I think in our world these days, um, we have to sort of define ourselves. Um, it, it seems to be necessary. Uh, our world seems to like to pigeonhole us. Um, so whether it's, you know, like when I was working in LA as a photojournalist, um, some people knew me just as a, a photographer who shot Hollywood. Other people just considered me a hard news photographer. So, um, you know, now doing these more recent projects, many people don't know about my photojournalism. So, I, you know, basically I'm just a photographer, a happy one. So. <laughs> I think at the moment, a happy photographer is a good photographer. So <laughs> I think we can perhaps move on from that shit. And so we now move on to perhaps the first of the project and then and share some of your, your images with our audience. Okay. Um, we're going to look at one person crying, women in war, which was a long-term project that you did between 84 and 2019. And I just wondered if you could talk a little bit about the conception of that and, and what you set out to do with that project, because it's a, it's a really interesting one. And it's just beautiful images as well. Um, well, I would have to say, I didn't know this was a project or was even going to be a project probably for the first 10 years of this work. Um, basically, I stumbled on stories, if you will, that caught my attention. Um, and one of the stories was of these Afghan, uh, the story about Afghan refugee women um, or Afghan women widows at the end of the 10 year war between the Soviet Union and Afghanistan. 
And at that point, I was in Pakistan uh, working on a, another story for the Los Angeles Times. And the reporter and I had finished the story in Karachi and came back to Islamabad. And I met with the, the head of the Associated Press just to bat around some story ideas. And she said to me, oh, well, there's a story that no one cares about. And she said, it's the, it's the plight of the Afghan war widows. And I thought, well, I actually care. And I was a little bit more wild hearted in those days and Pakistan was not quite as um, difficult as it is now. And somehow, I can't remember how I did it, but I actually made my way down to some refugee camps along the border and then I went up to Peshawar. And so um, I took a lot, I spent a week um, taking photographs and then sent them to the paper and then they redispatched my reporter to do the story. And it was a page one story, which pretty much broke the story of, of the Afghan widows. So, and it was a, for me personally, it was a pivotal moment um, as a photojournalist. I just felt like I was finally doing the work that I had always wanted to do. I mean, I loved working in Los Angeles, but I felt like I had outgrown grown it in a way. Um, and also it was such a heightened week of creativity, emotion, intensity, everything. Um, so, but then um, it was another 10 years, but, and then the next subject was uh, uh, Afghan, uh, sorry, it was uh, Kosovar Albanian refugees in um, Albania. So, and then gradually I kept going and going, sorry, I'm giving a lot of preamble here, um, but I didn't really realize it was a project until the early 2000s when I really designated it as a project and started choosing where I would go. Um, since we, um, hold on, oops, sorry. So since we sort of were limited with how many images I could show, I've just chosen four images from this project, but I'll say that um, once I really sort of committed myself to doing the work and the pivotal moment came for me, um, I chose to go to Hiroshima in 2002. Um, and was there six months after September 11th. And I met an extraordinary woman whose father was a peace activist after the, the A-bomb in Hiroshima. And I was so moved by her. In a way, I, I decided at that moment that I would just completely devote myself to this project regardless of the emotional, physical, financial toll it might take. So that was the the turning point when I started choosing places to go. Um, so fast forward, um, this is Monica Smith, who is uh, who was Anne Frank's second cousin. And sometimes I would just have an idea for a place I wanted to go and then I would do quite a bit of research before I would go there. Other times it was an idea that just kind of happened. So I was reading an article in the New York Times uh, in, uh, for Holocaust Remembrance Day and they featured Monica Smith and another woman who had known the Frank family. And I thought I have to meet this woman and photograph her. And so I called the New York Times since I had worked for them for many years, I had a lot of contacts and the reporter was kind enough to share his contact information. So I reached out to Monica's daughter who basically said, yes, we'd be happy for you to photograph her. So I went to New York in 2015 and photographed her. Um, so the project was very organic. And um, again, I wasn't sure um, how I was going <laughs> to do it, what it was going to become. Um, and again, I'm sorry, there are just a handful of them, four images here. So one of the stories that I felt very um, committed to telling was, you know, had to do with the war in Bosnia from 2000, sorry, from 1991 to 1995. And I went back, I went to Bosnia twice in 2009 um, because it was such an, you know, involved story to try to tell, you know, going around the Srebrenica municipality throughout Bosnia and Herzegovina. Um, and I really wanted to tell the story of the, the, the path of the Srebrenica massacre. So um, I had the opportunity to meet um, this woman. Her name is, um, uh, 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 Selma Hodzic, and that's her son Osman. And 
Selma's husband was um, killed in the Srebrenica massacre when she was actually pregnant with their second son. His first wife and daughter were killed earlier in the war. Um, so again, I, you know, I was choosing stories that were out of the news that I felt um, shouldn't be forgotten. And um, I mean, I think that's been a big driver for the whole project um, to tell the long stories, to take the long view, like meeting some of the Japanese women who, who survived the A-bomb. Um, it had been over 50 years since they had their experience. So I wanted to know how they processed their experience and, and basically made their life through it. And how, how long were you spending with it within, within each of the locations? Um, you went back to, uh, to Afghanistan, so Pakistan um, twice, I think you said, um, once from the news side and then once to start developing the project. Did you go back after that at all? Did you start to build relationships with your, your subjects? Um, yes and no. Often, I mean, uh, Bosnia, I went back to twice. Um, each trip was about three weeks. Um, this was in the picture now is in Vietnam and I spent a month in Vietnam. Um, some places I would go just for a lengthier span of time. Um, Northern Ireland, I was there three weeks. Um, Cambodia, I was there, I think two and a half weeks. Um, so they're not huge lengths of time, but I, I, they were quite intense. I mean, when I'm working first, before I decide to go somewhere, I do a lot of preliminary research and then would find somebody on the ground who would be my guide, my translator, my everything person. Um, so in Bosnia, uh, I was working with a former journalist who had become an academic, but he was, I hired him both trips because he knew the region, he knew where the former mass graves were, he knew the history. Um, Vietnam, I worked with sort of a husband and wife journalist and then ended up, the husband felt that I should just work with his wife, even though her English wasn't as good, but she, you know, we had more access to women and she was incredibly enterprising. So these trips were incredibly intense. And so I would get a lot done um, also in a short amount of time. So Vietnam was probably one of the hardest trips for me um, growing up with the Vietnam War as my as the backdrop of America during that time. Um, and uh, I, I felt a tremendous amount of guilt about the war. And, and also I'd seen so much imagery of the Vietnam War, you know, as it was happening and then over the years that I couldn't, I couldn't see past the photograph sort of in my mind's eye from the war. And Agent Orange was, one of the horrible legacies of the war. And so one of the stories that I wanted to tell for my project was, you know, the, 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 the fallout from Agent Orange. So this mother, her name is Latitu. Um, she, her father had been a soldier, um, a Vietnamese soldier, and he was exposed to Agent Orange dioxin. And so she was born with some birth defects and her parents begged her not to marry, but she did and she has two children. And her son seems to be okay, he seems to be fine, but the daughter has severe Agent Orange disease. So this was a really, on top of all the emotion and the psychological challenges of the experience being there, I was also thinking photographically because I, I photographed victims of Agent Orange in multiple settings. I went to some homes where they were sort of homes for Agent Orange victims. And some of the cases were so severe and the people were so disfigured. And I took pictures, but I was so concerned. Um, I didn't want the picture to be so horrifying in the context of the rest of the body of work that it would sort of stand out in, in a way, um, so I it was it was really challenging because I wanted to tell the story, um, and yet have all of the images in one person crying show a balanced presentation. So um, anyway, so this was the picture I told, which is you know very quiet in a way, but still quite heartbreaking. Well, how do you deal with that from at a, on, a, on a, an emotional level? I mean, the, the, the Agent Orange in Vietnam pictures particularly are, are you know, they're, they're, they're 
you know, they're hard to look at really. Um, and so it must take its toll while you're out there. And, and then when you come back to edit, to relook at your work. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, uh, you know, it's been a hard project emotionally and psychologically, but um, I wouldn't change it for the world. And I think, you know, I, I'm a storyteller and I felt that these stories were important to tell and to let all these people who've survived war. It's basically, basically I'm a reteller of stories, if you will. Um, you know, I sort of see myself as a conduit, um, but I feel it's important to document. And again, it's for me, it's the long view, it's the post-war. You know, journalists and people can zoom in and zoom out, and yet these people are in, in their lives forever. So um, that, that was the story I wanted to tell. How do these people live with these experiences five, 10, 20, 50 years down the road? Um, and have, you, have so. you managed to retain um, some contact with some of the, the people that you photographed? You know, I mean, it is a very long-term project, and, um, but have you maintained contact with some of your subjects? Yes, so I've been in contact with some of the, 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 the mothers um, who lost sons in Iraq, um, some of the, the, the mothers in um, uh, Ohio. Um, I, I have some contact with some of the women in Bosnia, and um, I know I could make contact with many of the other women through my sort of liaison person. So, um, yeah, so they know about the project. So, yeah. Um, I mean, you said that the, the project came about fairly organically, but I mean, at some point when, when you perhaps had the idea that this was some, you know, this was going to be a body of work, did you, was it conceived that at that point then as, as an exhibition or as a book, or did you see the two going hand in hand? So I know, I know this is obviously a, a touring exhibition, and I, I believe it's still touring, but I think you've also said um, in, in, in your writings that you, you see a book here as well. Um. You know, Michael, I think for so many years, I was like in almost a tunnel with it. I was so almost possessed by it. And um, I, I didn't know why I was doing it. I didn't know how I was gonna finish it. And I didn't know how I would finish it in terms of when I would know that it was done, um, not that I couldn't finish it, just to clarify that. Um, and I didn't know what it would be. Um, my personal side of this whole story is my family's Holocaust history. So um, my parents uh, came to America. They actually met on the original Queen Mary coming to America in October of 1938, right ahead of World War II, and then what would become the Holocaust. And my father's parents and grandmother and an uncle were killed on a mass in a massacre on the doorstep of their home in 1942. And then on my mother's side of the family, her parents were saved in Budapest by Raoul Wallenberg. But one of her brothers uh, died. Um, he was a soldier in the Hungarian army and he died in a Russian labor camp in 1944. So there was, there was, you know, deep Holocaust pain history and I don't I don't know about anybody else my parents never spoke about anything so I'm sure there's more you know stories and I think in a way I didn't really understand that this was also about my journey to sort of excavate my own family's history um, sort of what I consider the inheritance of sort of trauma and pain um, so I ended up going when I, after I finished in Bosnia and Herzegovina, I ended up going to Novi Sad, which is where my father came from. And uh, the man I was working with, Zoran, we went there and we actually found my grandparents' home um, where they were killed. And then we found a monument dedicated to the massacre and there was a plaque with names on it. And so my grandparents' names are on that plaque. And when Zoran showed it to me, I was just, hysterically crying, it, you know, it was like, they, be, they became real for me. Mm. Um, and I thought to myself, okay, maybe this is what this whole journey has been about. Um, and that was in 2009. And so I guess I think I hoped that that was the end point, but it actually wasn't. There was still more work to do, um, go to Vietnam, 
And so in 2011, I was approached by the director of the Museum of Tolerance in LA to create an exhibition of this work um, because they, they had an Anne Frank exhibition coming in for 10 years into their main gallery space. And she said she wanted to do one person crying before she had to turn over the gallery. So she was really the, the impetus to put the exhibition together. Um, so again, I kept photographing uh, and then in 2018, I had an opportunity to go to Jordan to photograph Syrian, Iraqi and, and Sudanese refugee women. So in 2019, I chose to put an end point to the project and that was to go to the hometown of my great grandmother who was also killed in the massacre. And she was from Satumare, what is now in Romania. When she was born, it was Austro-Hungary. So um, it's been a long, <laughs> it's been a long journey. And um, so finally, I'm hoping to start working on the book next year. Um, the pandemic kind of, you know, has, has put everything on hold like for everyone, but also, I think I needed a bit of distance from the project, um, psychologically, emotionally. Um, it took a lot out of me. And I also feel to do a book properly, I, lean, I need a little bit of perspective on everything. Well, you slightly preempted my, my sort of last question on this project, but um, I mean, the project normally came to an end in 2019. Are you, are you confident that it is finished? You, you, you don't have any sense that you might reopen it or continue <laughs> something that happens that you felt really needed to be in that book? Oh God, well, um, so the answer is, you know, <laughs> until, until it is actually at the printer on the press, um, I'll probably be shooting. So, so the answer is yes. Um, there's actually still a couple more <laughs> subjects I would like to photograph. Um, uh, if I can find any women who fought with the resistance um, uh, in Italy or in France, um, or I know there were a lot of Jewish women who, who fought with the resistance in Poland. Um, so I'd actually love to find some of these women, even if it's two or three of them. I actually photographed some English women also at the end of 2019 and, and one of them had worked uh, and actually was dropped into Italy to work with the resistance. And so she kind of inspired this idea. So that's one subject I'd like to do, but you know, these women are quite elderly. So I'd, I'd even be happy just meeting a few of them. And then also there's another story here in England that I would like to tell, which is um, the story of the Gurkha fighters and um, you know, the, the consequences to their community. So uh, that's something I hope to do later this year, you know, ho hopefully when things open up. Um, but for right now, that's kind of it, so. <laughs> it's probably a good, good point to move on to Infinite Light, which is a um, subtitle of the Photographic Meditation on Tibet. Um, now th this dates from between 2007 and 2010, so it's concurrent with what you were doing um, over Women in War. And I wonder if that it, this project was a way to just distance yourself from some of that intensity and emotion that was, was happening with that other work. Um, well, the answer is yes, um, but there was a deeper sort of impulse to go to Tibet. I had always, I don't know, I, I always had a, an affinity with Tibetans uh, who I met when I was working in Asia. Um, I did a number of stories on the Tibetan diaspora and just, I don't know, I, 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 it was this, I, I've always had kind of, again, an affinity. Um, and at one point when I was, was still working in, in Southeast Asia, I went to Goa, India and I met some Tibetans um, and I actually bought a necklace from them. The wife and the husband, they were selling jewelry on a blanket. And I, I, I still wear that necklace every day. Now it's 32 years. So I can't, the pull, the pull to go to Tibet was always there. And so for my 50th birthday, I decided that that would be where I would go. And I thought, okay, now what am I going to photograph with? I had no idea if I would even respond, you know, photographically. Um, I knew I didn't want to shoot black and white. I didn't want to shoot digital. And so the one film that 
I felt could probably really work well in Tibet was Kodachrome because I knew from seeing other photographs of Tibet that the reds are quite vibrant and Kodachrome was always known for its, its the vibrancy of its reds and yellows. So I found Kodachrome, um, I bought a hundred rolls and went to Tibet and just completely was, I don't know, captivated. Um, I loved every second of it. Um, I responded so creatively and photographically. Um, it was almost like sometimes I felt I just had to show up and just look up and there was a photograph. Um, and I came back after the first trip and was just absolutely like heartsick with longing to go back and didn't go back for another three years. Um, the next year was the Tibetan uprising. And then the following year, um, let's say, sorry, let me, that 2009 was a super heavy, heavy traveling year for the women in war project. So when I went, I went to Cambodia and then Bosnia and Herzegovina twice. So there was just no way to go to Tibet financially or psychologically. And then I went back to Tibet in 2010 and photographed another hundred rolls of film and um, was bereft when I left. I, I, I tell people, I know this will sound crazy, but I tell people I would have been quite happy to die there actually. And sort of just, I was so, I loved it there and I was so peaceful there. So yeah, I would say Tibet really in a way healed me. Um, the beginnings of sort of healing me from all of the war work. Um, it was, for me, it was just transcendent. So quite clearly lived up to, to expectations and photographically, were you pleased with what you achieved on that first trip? Yes, and it was interesting because there was one image that was like a breakthrough image for me, which felt almost like a painting. Um, so on the second trip, I actually even let myself go more, you know, to just be lo even looser taking pictures. Um, but the first trip I was almost thinking like cinematically and I had sort of a vision, like an idea before I left on the first trip that I wanted to see the pictures sort of unfurling by colors, um, the colors of the Tibetan prayer flags. So of course I couldn't pre-imagine what the actual image would be, but I knew that I wanted to you know, start with the blues. And, and so, um, I don't know, again, I was thinking almost cinematically, even as I was only taking still images. So after the first trip, I was, I couldn't wait to go back. And then after the second trip, um, it, was, it was there, it was all there. Um, but I think I left a piece of my heart there. <laughs> so this was, so one day we were um, uh, at, at going up to Everest base camp and there's a wonderful little monastery where a lot of the mountaineers go uh, to make offerings. It's called Rongbuk Monastery. And so there was just this halo on the sun and I literally just looked up and that's what I saw. So. And I mean, you must, I mean, Kodachrome obviously has a long history and I mean, that was obviously clearly a deliberate decision as you just explained. And did, did it again, did that live up to expectations in terms of what you came back with? Absolutely. I mean, Kodachrome that, you know, was always known as the black and white of color film. And so the blacks in Kodachrome, I, you know, were almost the truest photographic black other than probably black and white film. Mm -hmm. So I loved, and then when I was doing the book, um, I didn't want any white anywhere in the book other than whatever the white would be in the images. So um, yeah, I, I, I love Kodachrome. I was heartbroken, you know, that it's gone the way of the pterodactyl. I think think everyone is, uh, there's occasional talks about it coming back, but I think technically it's just not, not gonna happen. And there's a lot of broken hearts well, it's the chemistry, you know, yeah. and Kodak has to get behind that. And I don't think they will. I mean, they made a lot of mis financial mistakes the last, you know, 10, 15, 20 years. And so I, I doubt, um, I'm sorry to say, as long as they keep Tri-X, I'll be happy. So, <laughs> <laughs> so um, sometimes I like, you know, taking images that almost feel like, you know, up is down, left is right. So this is a straight image full frame, nothing manipulated. So 
there was a vat of water um, outside the Jokon Monastery in Lhasa that pilgrims were dropping money into, and the monks had been floating these Gerber daisies. So this is just a straight photograph looking down into the vat, and on the, the left are sort of the reflections of clouds from the sky. But um, it's, it's one of those mysterious photographs. It's actually a completely straight image. And, and you mentioned earlier that um, you didn't have the, the resources to go through this. I mean, these trips are, are mostly self-funded, are they? Do you, do you try and secure commissions to help support them or, or do you try and do that when you get back? Um, well, you know, with the Women in War Project, I applied for some grants like in 1999, 2000, which I didn't get. And if there's one thing I understand, it's time. And I knew that I couldn't wait for grants because some of the older women, certainly the survivors of Hiroshima or World War II, you know, they were older and they were dying. So, um, so sometimes I was pretty crafty. So I actually, um, how I got to Japan was I was doing a food story for Subur Magazine. And so I, ended up taking an extra week to go to Hiroshima. Um, and then my oldest brother died in 2004 and left some money to everybody. And so I basically invested the money and used it cautiously, you know, to fund the trips. Um, but, you know, the, the trips, you know, they were manageable. They weren't, I wasn't staying at the Ritz Carlton. <laughs> so, um, you know, I, I, I stretched it and I would, again, um, figured out ways to, to keep going on it, um, piggybacking other work sometimes in different places. Um, and, and how did that second trip differ, or did it differ from, from 2007? Because you, you obviously went back in September 2010. To bat, um, well, um, it was a little different. I mean, my marriage to my husband at the time that we did the first trip to Tibet came back. Our marriage actually sort of disintegrated after that trip. Um, and so the second trip, I took a good friend of mine with me, a woman friend. And so it was, and we chose, I chose not to go too far out of Lhasa where the first trip we did sort of a cross country. Um, so it was just, it was different energetically. Um, Lhasa was different because of the uprising in 2008, which had been quite horrendous. There was very little news that came out of it, but a lot of monks were killed. Um, and it was pretty heart-wrenching for me because some of the places they were building police stations in the monasteries and, it was clear that Tibet was changing quickly. Um, so I tried to not see that. It was almost like I just, I put on these sort of psychological blinkers. So I, I could just see what I was feeling about Tibet and the, the Buddhism and the land, the people rather than you know, seeing these changes. So uh, it, was, it, was, it was challenging for me because as a photojournalist, you see everything and you want to tell that side of the story. But the second trip, I just still wanted to tell the feeling of Tibet, the emotion of Tibet, um, sort of the compression of the Buddhism through the images. So, um, but, I, but the second trip was harder in a way because I knew I would never go back. Um, uh, again, I was going to ask if you, you know, do you think or, well, you, you've already said you, would, you don't think you'll go back, but do you, uh, is that categorical? Do you think you'd be able to create images? I mean, clearly the political situation now is so, so distant from how it was back then. Do you think you'd be able to go back and do photography in the way that you did previously? Um, no, I'll never go back for a couple reasons. Um, personal reason is, uh, well, I would say the, the second reason probably is the overarching one, which is, um, his Holiness the Dalai Lama wrote the foreword for my book. And so basically I'm probably not ever going to get back in because of that. Um, but also the two trips were so extraordinary. I, I wouldn't want to take away from those memories and experiences by going back and having a different experience. And in, in a way they were what they were and the book 
um, is the is the manifestation of that. So I uh, I just have to keep Tibet inside of my heart. Okay, we have can we have a look at there we are. This, yeah, the, the next pictures from Tibet. So I put this one in, even though it's it's a photograph of a portion of a mural. Um, because this was a, a mural painted on the door um, of the 13 Dalai Lama's summer palace at Norbulinka in Lhasa. And um, I love, I don't know, this, it, it feels so alive to me, these birds and the beauty of it. And so I decided, I don't know, this really isn't a still life because it's a photograph of a, of a mural, but it's something, um, for me, it's very evocative of, of the feeling of being there. Um, and then I think we've got one more from this series, haven't we? Yeah. So this photograph um, was taken at the Sakya Monastery, um, and um, which is one of the biggest monasteries. And also, it was not touched uh, during the you know the the, the the Chinese uprising. And so inside, you still have all the original relics. Um, there's a 700 year old library and the main sanctuary, the support beams are actually these huge tree trunks, which are, it's, it's un incredibly moving and extraordinary. And so um, I was outside and this lone monk came out. And for me, I loved this, the cloth, you know, that, that you know, keeps, protects, the wind from going in, it, it reminded me of a Jean Miro painting. And the fact that you could almost, the evidence of the wind and the billowing um, cloth. Um, so this, this for me, it really is Tibet. Um, so it's, it's energy, it's light, it's devotion. Um, so, yeah. The, the third series we're going to look at then, it, or some images from it, is called The Crossing on the Atlantic Ocean. And you made that between 2015 and 2019 on transatlantic crossings between New York and Southampton. And I'm going to pick up on something in just a moment, but this, this comes across as a, as a much more contemplative, it's, it's much more perhaps coming back to that, those labels we spoke about at the beginning, it's, it's perhaps more, much more traditional or classic fine art photography. Was that a deliberate intention or is it just the way the project evolved and developed? Um, so I never have any premeditation on my work or a project. Um, typically I'll get sort of caught with I don't know how to say it, like an impulse or an, a sort of an idea, but it's almost like something inhabits me to just go, propels me forward. And um, so I never anticipate what I'm gonna see or how I'm gonna react. I hope I will, but um, so this project, so I had finished the Tibet book um, Women and War was kind of quiet at that point. And then I thought, okay, now what? Um, but I kept thinking about my parents and I kept thinking about their crossing to America um, and what, it, what did it feel like? I mean, I know what it must have meant to them emotionally, psychologically, probably saved their lives. Um, so I wanted to experience what it felt like to cross an ocean. You know, what does it mean to go from continent to continent, change your life? So I was reading the Sunday New York Times uh, uh, travel section and all of a sudden there was an ad for Cunard, um, you know, 175th anniversary special transatlantic crossings and this thing like, oh, and then I, I had been already writing out the words, the crossing, the crossing. So the idea was clearly percolating in my subconscious. And so I see this ad for transatlantic crossings and I like jumped out of my chair and called Cunard and I said, tell me about the crossings. And they told me, and they said the first crossing leaves on such and such a date, which happened to be my birthday. And I thought, okay, that's it. I'm, that's, that's it. <laughs> it's just, it's obvious I need to do this. So I booked it. And the first crossing was just, it was so emotional for me. Um, I kept thinking about my parents and, um, and again, what film do I choose? So 
I tested, I think, six or eight different color transparency films to, to see the difference in the palette. I photographed a swimming pool, so I had a consistent subject. And so then I chose Provia 100 um, as my film. I liked the color palette and I knew that I'd be on the ocean, so the blues were important. So again, I took a hundred rolls of film and just shot whatever kind of captivate and I completely fell in love with the ocean. Um, so there's this series which was done at twilight. And again, I had no idea what it was gonna be. I didn't see it until I got the film process. So the light sort of in the bottom half, that's actually the light from the ship hitting the water. Um, so anyway. That's that's what this is. <laughs> I think for the, the audience, if you didn't pick up on it, I think it's worth pointing out that you, you traveled on the, the Queen Mary the second on the yeah. and your your parents obviously had been on the, the original Queen Mary and uh, just to bring those two things together, I can see it must have been very, very intense for you. Yeah, it was it was pretty emotionally charged and um, but yeah, I'm not afraid of that, you know, in a way, um, for me, that's an important component, you know, to my storytelling, to my work a lot, you know, because all of this is so personal. Um, that's part of it. Um, so, but this for me also is evocative of the magic of photography. Um, Again, you've written about or spoken about dark and light and the contrast and interplay between the two. And I think that comes across really beautifully in this, well, this image, but also some of the others. And if we can have a look at the next one, perhaps. And... So I chose a cabin on the lowest possible uh, level um, with like an open, little open balcony space. So I could be as close to the waterline as possible. Um, and so I, at midship, um, so often I would just stand there watching um, the ocean or, you know, of course, when the, 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 the ship crosses, you know, a, sort of a swell, it makes a wave. So I was just, I, I don't know, I just, I was so happy and I was rationing my film um, because I knew if I run out of film, there's no more film. <laughs> Um, so I think I was rationing between eight and 10 rolls a day or something, or 10 and 12 rolls a day. So I would do these spurts of picture taking and, um, but this, I, I love sort of, you know, the ocean almost feels like musculature sinews, um, but the energy of it, you, you kind of really understand, you know, sort of the energy that comes out of it. And I, I love that. Did you, did you ha have a, an idea of what you wanted to do with these pictures when you came back or again did that evolve? no no again I just I, I I don't I don't really overthink it um I knew I wanted to do another trip and so I made another crossing in August of 2018 sorry 2016 um, and then I wanted to do a crossing in the same direction that my parents came so the first two crossings were from New York to Southampton and then in 2018, I did a back-to-back -back crossing. So I think I left, it was New York, no, it was Southampton, New York, Southampton. Um, and then I did that again. Um, so I did two uh, east to west crossings and then uh, five you know, west to east. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah, and every time the light was different, the ocean was different, I, I would change sides on the ship. Um, so sometimes I was on the port side going east, sometimes I was on the starboard side. I wanted to experience it, the light from each side, each way, um, you know, just so I had north facing or south facing. And I was walking all over the ship all the time, but I, I would say the majority of the pictures came from my little, my little balcony. Um, I think we've just got one final image in this series from 2016, yeah. again, a very different picture. Yeah, so this, in my screen, it looks a little blue. It's, it actually is a, a bit more purple in reality. Um, so it's, it was almost, I suppose, like a Rothko painting. It's just so diffused and quiet and calm. Um, so I, I, I fell in love with the ocean. And in a way, I think this project more than Tibet um, really in a way has been a, a, a big, um, I hate to use the word healer, but I, you know, this kind of has helped me to just 
take a breath. You know, it was just the pure beauty and the emotion. Um, so, uh, and I suppose a catharsis from all of all of the war work that I've done and the Holocaust work that I've done. So it sort of brings us quite neatly to, um, time wise to to the end of, of the sort of formal part. But I'd just like to ask a sort of final question before we open out to our audience questions. Um, I mean, it's really as much about what you're working on now. Is, is, are there bodies of work that you're working on over the period you know, that you've started and are continuing to work on? I know you're curating an exhibition about Frank Hurley, which is really interesting. Um, but perhaps you could just tell us a little bit about what, what you're doing at the moment. Um, so in terms of projects, well, um, a little project sort of snuck in in the last year, quite unexpectedly, um, courtesy of the pandemic. <laughs> um, so I was staying with a good friend um, uh, with her in, at, at her house in Surrey for the first lockdown. And I always have a little uh, camera, my contacts camera, my little titanium old contacts loaded with Tri-X, my favorite black and white film. And so I would just, I was randomly taking pictures and then had no recall what I shot. And then when I got back to London in July, I had the film processed and actually almost had an anxiety attack when I saw it because it brought back all of the sort of anxiety from the pandemic and um, ended up realizing it was a pretty interesting series, like a diary of my impressions of, you know, the emotional sort of response to the pandemic. So I kept going, taking pictures through to December um, and have decided to do a little project on this. It's called Cantata. And um, I'm now working, putting a book, book presentation together. So I hope it's gonna be a little book. Otherwise, um, I don't really have any other personal projects. Um, now I'm sort of looking outward again. Uh, the Hurley project has finally been bumped up to the uh, front burner. Um, I have to raise a lot of money to fund it. Um, I'm working with a company in LA called Curatorial and they'll be traveling the exhibition and fabricating it. So we have to find some corporate sponsors. Um, so that's once the pandemic starts you know, easing. Um, and then I'm, I'm, looking, I'm looking for work actually. Um, uh earning a living um but i'm open to just about anything i feel actually i'm pretty excited um not to have the war work on my back anymore i mean it really possessed me for a long time and so now i'm i'm interested in doing work that addresses ecology the environment but i'm open you know i'm i'm kind of you know, the same feeling, the same feeling when you go out with a camera and you have that sense of expectancy, you don't know what you're going to see. So I sort of feel that with my life at the moment. <laughs> There's a challenge for the audience then as well. We've, and uh, we've got some, couple of, some questions already coming in from the audience. So I'm, I'm going to pick up with Edwards because we sort of touched on it earlier on. But Edwards is asking, um, do you ever finish a project or are they all open ended? Um, I would say I always finish my projects. Um, and I didn't know that I even had that in me um, until I did my first book, which was on the Philippines. Um, I lived in the Philippines uh, for a year from 87 to 88 and felt like I had the beginnings of a project and then kept going back and going back and then um, took me five years to find a publisher. And then once I found the publisher, I made one more trip. So I, I didn't know I had it in me to finish a project. I mean, I, 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 you know, I think a lot of people have good ideas. They, not everybody starts the idea. Not everybody gets to the middle of the idea and not everybody finishes a project, but I, I do finish them. And I think, you know, I'm interested in a lot of things. And so, I think I, I just kind of know when I'm done and something else stimulates my creativity, intellect. Um, yeah. And Carol is asking a perhaps more technical question that firstly, she thoroughly enjoyed the talk. And she's asking whether you shoot digital at all or is all of your work analog? And then asking really why that might be. 
Um, so Carol, thanks for your question. Um, yes, I shoot digital. Um, when I work uh, either as a photojournalist or do uh, other types of work, uh, I haven't done much of that here in London, but in LA, I shoot digital all the time. Um, I from my, and I did actually a project. For, I did a, a project for the city of LA public art division, um, it, which was an exhibition at the airport, which was great because <laughs> it's the metaphor for traveling all the time. So I'm not allergic to digital. Um, for my personal work, I still love film. Um, for me, it's a different way of shooting. It's it's much more organic. I don't have to think about anything uh, other than, you know, focusing and the right, you know, shutter speed and f-stop and all that. But um, I still love film because film is alchemy. Um, and I love the magic of the alchemy. You kind of never really know what oh. you get. So. so gray out there. Oops. Got a slight experience there. Um, We've got a question from Mark. Um, firstly, he's saying what a fabulous talk it was, um, but he's also asking whether there's a difference to you between a story and a project. Ah, that's a good question. Thank you, Mark, for asking that. Um, well, I think for me, you know, I, I, I consider myself a storyteller. So um, I think, the Tibet project, I wouldn't say it's a story. Um, I would say uh, in that case, there really isn't a story, but it is a project. The, the crossing is definitely, was the story of my parents, which, which was the impetus for it. Um, so, and then of Women in War, of course, is hundreds of stories. It's all, all stories. And so there's, there's like a mosaic. So I almost see it like a quilt. You know, you have every square is a different story and then you put it all together and it's, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a project. So I don't, I don't, you know, Cantata, my little, you know, COVID project is not, it's a little project. So it's, no, it's not a story. I don't think it, I don't think there's any hard and fast rules. Um, I, I think, I think there's too much emphasis sometimes on structure or left brain or premeditating work, whether it's a body of work or something else. And sometimes you just have to let the work or the, you know, the creativity drive you, you know, sort of, as I tell people, you know, trust the journey. It's telling you and you have to be in your right brain in order to receive it. You can't be so always so structured in your left brain. It's important. I mean, I was very proactive with women in war, but a lot of times also I would let myself be guided by, you know, once I was on the ground working, I was much more organic and let whomever path I was gonna cross or if Zoran said, let's go here, I, I completely surrendered. You know, up to that point, I was very deliberate. So um, yeah, I kind of surrendered to, the creative muse. Um. We have one final question here from a very astute member of our audience that's uh, noticed that you're a fellow of the Royal Geographical Society and is asking about this relationship between uh, clip that your work is, is often rooted with people but there's a clear sense of place that seems to to come through as well and is, could you talk a little bit about that? Um, yeah, I love the Royal Geographical Society. I mean, I think um, I'm an adventurer at heart. Um, you know, I, I, I saw the movie Around the World in 80 Days, I think when I was like eight years old and it just completely, I wanted to be in the, you know, the helium balloon basket with them. Um, so I, I love the world. Um, my only goal in life is to visit a hundred countries before I die. So I think I still have about 30 to go. Um, but yeah, no, I, I, I love geography. And I think my parents were, you know, they were European. They were both multilingual. They, you know, looked at the world as a whole. They started taking me on trips when I was young. Um, my dad took me to Asia when I was 20. He had some business trips there. And it was just 
I fell in love with it. So I love the RGS. Um, yeah, I mean, I love, you know, the people who go there, they have an expansive view of the world. And, um, you know, it's, it's fun. It's also storytelling. Um, and especially some of the women, you know, like Gertrude Bell, I mean, like, wow, I would have loved to have been her, you know, <laughs> so yeah. Um, um, so uh, Simon, just a comment from Simon, who's saying that he loves the idea of the the quilt metaphor that you you you, you um, mentioned earlier on, um, and he's just thanking you for the talk. And then Carol's back with a follow up question. She's saying, "I'm very interested to hear what the, uh, to hear you say that you don't have a plan when you go out to start a new project, as in you let your intuition guide you." I've been trying to learn to put pen to paper beforehand with a set plan. So it's inspiring to hear that that really is not necessary. Well, I think, um, you know, I think you have to, you know, we live in a left brain binary world. I mean, now more than ever with, you know, cell phones and computers, but, you know, our intuitions and our inner voice, our gut are pretty um, formidable if we let them be. Um, I, in, in 2000, I was commissioned by the LA Public Library to do a, sort of a photo story on downtown Los Angeles or treat it like a neighborhood. Um, the, it was gonna be the Democratic Convention was gonna be there. And um, so I sat down with the, the director of the library and we literally pulled out a map and we put yellow highlighters, what would be my, and it was of course four freeways. And I was like, oh my God, how do I start this thing? And so again, I just kind of let go and I thought, okay. So the first day I went out and I drove around until I found a parking place. And when I found a parking place, I started walking. And that's how I started the project. Otherwise it was too daunting to try to tick off the list of things. So I just started walking. So I just think, let yourself go. Um, I mean, trust trust your journey, trust your feet, trust your eye. I mean, it's all, it all boils down to the eye and the heart and the hand. Um, and none of that has to do, you know, I mean, the brain, yes, but creativity is also instinctive and intuitive. Um, and it's just, it's there. So yeah, trust, trust your, trust yourself, trust your eye, trust your right brain. <laughs> I think that's a perfect way to end this evening. So thank you, uh, Marissa. Thank you so much for, for sharing those insights into those three projects and, and actually for talking so openly about your, your work as a photographer, as an artist, you know, however you like to be described or describe yourself. It's, it's been really insightful and I think the audience particularly has, has appreciated that. So thank you again for this evening and thank you to the audience for joining us as well. Um, I will send out the link to Marissa's website um, separately. So I did encourage you to go and look at some of her other projects and other work and some of her publications which are on her website as well. So thank you everyone for joining us this evening. Thank you Marissa and we hope to see you at future RPS events um, in the next few weeks. Thank you. Good night everyone. Good night. Thank you Michael and thank you everyone out there in the, the world. <laughs> Bye. <laughs> Good night everyone. <laughs>